So what do we know about interventions that affect epigenetic age? Well, back in 2018, we analyzed the Framing M Heart study and we found a very weak correlation between self-reported omega-3 intake and grim age. Weak correlation 0.1. And as you know, these observational studies cannot be trusted. What was really needed was a clinical trial. And you know, seven years later, I'm very pleased to mention um, a Swiss professor, Heike Bischof Ferrari, um, accessed blood samples from a randomized controlled clinical trial. This was a flawless study blinded. The people took a pill, they didn't know what they were taking. It was a blinded, very well controlled study of not just omega-3, also vitamin D and a home exercise program. And um, the study was noteworthy in regards to another aspect, which are, are the participants. All of the people who participated were healthy older adults they were 71 years or older, average age 75, but overall pretty healthy. And the study lasted for three years and um, sample size um, 780 samples. And what did we see? So here at the bottom, I show you grim age, the, the effect, and there are different interventions. And for people with a good eye, um, I mentioned that omega-3 led to a small reduction in grim age. And um, the upper panel shows you another uh, widely used uh, 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 mortality predictor, uh, a methylation clock known as uh, phenoage. And so both clocks really show that omega-3 supplementation reduced um, epigenetic aging. I want to say uh, the dosage was uh, one gram. I mentioned the dosage because um, some people have found that if large quantities of omega-3 may lead to atrial fibrillation. So be cautious, dosage uh, matters. Now, the one thing I was quite disappointed in in this study is we also, of course, um, so one disappointment was vitamin D. I take vitamin D every day. There wasn't really a strong effect. The next disappointment was um, this home exercise program. So these people did some home exercise intervention and there was no effect. But then one would say, well, maybe they didn't exercise hard enough more vigorous exercise is needed. And what is the most vigorous exercise you can think of participating in the Olympiad? Okay? So this is an interesting collaboration with uh, um, Hungarian professor Zolt Radak, who had uh, blood samples from a unique cohort. These were now Olympic champions and age-matched controls. And sure enough, the, Oli the Olympic champions who had won a medal less than 10 years ago, their epigenetic age was lower than expected. So I liked that result. But the interesting finding was people who had um, uh, gained an Olympic medal more than 10 years ago, they didn't differ from the controls, you know. And that again perhaps illustrates this bouncing back effect, you know. You can't just participate in the Olympiad and just assume now you're rejuvenated for the rest of your life, you know. You just need to keep working on it. You know? um, by the way, I'm getting scary time messages. Should I continue? Oh, okay, yeah. You, you stop me, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, um, hormone treatments. Um, hormone treatments are controversial, um, pe um, but what we have found is that postmenopausal hormone therapy very much uh, uh, slows the epigenetic age of skin cells, more precisely buccal epithelial cells. Um, so these are skin cells. But we never found an effect in blood, disappointingly, you know. 
And um, my mother-in-law said, but everyone knows that hormonal therapy keeps your skin young, you know. So anyways, but we find it also with a methylation clock. Um, but more, so you notice a lot of things relate to epigenetic clock. Inflammatory exposures, um, hormones, um, temperature perhaps, and so on. And so the question is, what makes epigenetic clocks tick? And we recently published a paper with Mardi Mokri, um, where we listed five factors, and I just enumerate them. Cellular replication, the number of mitosis matters. Cellular composition matters. If you analyze blood, the abundance of naive T cells versus memory T cells. Um, and of course, many exposures, smoking exposures, metabolic stress. If you're obese, it accelerates your clocks. And um, the fact, so the clocks differ in their sensitivities. Some clocks really relate to cell differentiation or proliferation, others don't. And that um, poses challenges for the data analyst. The data analyst needs to very much think about what covariates they put in the model. Um, here I uh, present a, a review paper that I published with Andrew Teschendorf on building novel clocks because the epigenetic clock field is very active. Uh, I want to say every other week a new clock comes out, which is wonderful. And um, here we again reviewed all the factors that are known to influence epigenetic clocks. So now I mentioned circadian rhythm. There's a paper that claims if you measure your methylation age at midnight, you're slightly, slightly younger than if you measure it at lunchtime, which is an interesting claim. Um, yes, and um, now the other thing I want to mention is that um, we are now in the era of artificial intent intelligence, the so-called uh, large language models. We are in the era of deep learning. And of course, most of my clocks were based on so-called so so penalized regression, which is a phenomenal regression model. But um, people have used deep learning approaches um, to build more accurate clocks. So... Um, there's a lot that can be done. The biggest distinction between clocks is whether they are meant to measure chronologic age or mortality risk or another readout of biologic age. So you can distinguish them along those lines. Um, I want to mention that we have very accurate predictors of maximum lifespan in mammals. If you give me the DNA of any animal, any mammal, I can give you a rough estimate of its maximum lifespan or its age at sexual maturity or gestation time. So again, methylation encodes these life history traits. And one thing we found with these studies is, again, um, what some of you may know already, that dwarf mice age more slowly and conversely have a longer maximum lifespan. That's known from the literature. This is 20-year-old findings, but we can confirm it with our methylation clocks. Um, the new frontier in methylation clocks when it comes to different species is to um, extend um, methylation clocks to non-mammalian species, ideally all vertebrates. So um, we have some progress in that arena. We have some prototype clocks for frogs and axolotl, amphibians. These clocks are not very accurate, but they show proof of concept. Um, I started earlier talking about female hormones. I want to briefly talk about male hormones, androgens. So there was a wonderful paper by Tim Hoare and Victoria Sugru who found one cytosine in the DNA that is very responsive to androgen exposure. And um, it, it really um, it can measure exposure of in, in multiple species, in mice, in sheep. So for example, here, and they call it the androgen clock. So here, 
um, they administered an, an androgen DHT to female mice, and sure enough, the methylation increased in that um, in that uh, cytosine. And conversely, they you need the androgen receptor because if you knock out the androgen receptor in these mice and you then administer the hormone, nothing happens. So this is the one epigenetic clock where we truly understand the mechanism from A to Z. Androgen exposure leads to gain of methylation in this cytosine. Um, I want to end by talking about longitudinal studies. They will absolutely be needed to show causality. In other words, we need to measure um, whether an increase in grim age over multiple blood draws means you, are, you have a poor prognosis for mortality. And there was another uh, wonderful Italian cohort, the Inchianti cohort. This is a study with Luigi uh, Ferrucci and an Italian team where they really looked at this question. They had blood samples uh, from almost 700 people, Italian participants, and they had um, at least two blood draws, sometimes three or four, and they could measure rate of change. And sure enough, they found rate of change in these people meant faster um, uh, um, decline, um, earlier death. So in summary, um, methylation is quite appealing. Why? It's intellectually appealing. The same molecule that carries uh, genetic information um, encodes time. This, the beauty of the universal, universality of aging processes. We have one clock that measures aging in all mammalian species. Um, so it cannot just be random noise. There's something really conserved in aging. The next thing that's so beautiful, and that goes to the Clotho story, we can connect um, life, um, the life course. We can measure, connect aging in a fetus to aging in a centenarian. There's something very um, appealing about that idea. Uh, methylation clocks are ready for human clinical trials. People are using them. They are also used for in vitro studies. Many people use, apply them to fibroblasts, keratinocytes, any um, cell culture system. And um, I'll stop by thanking my many collaborators. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.